Good morning, everyone. Good morning again. And my name is Anna Sharochinska. I am one of MA Europe trustees. And uh, as you can guess, uh, this workshop is brought to you by MA Media Associates International Europe. Two days ago, we were talking with uh, Daniel Hofkamp. And Daniel Hofkamp was uh, from Spain. He was, uh, we were talking with him about different social media strategies. And today we have an honor to welcome uh, a jack of uh, many trades, uh, Carla Carreña. Carla Carreña is, was born in Brazil, but lives in Sweden and works almost uh, all over the world, but mostly in Europe. And today we'll be talking about the present and future of book markets. Uh, I shouldn't be saying book markets because probably we'll be talking about the present and future of uh, content markets. And we'll discuss how to fix what was broken by the COVID crisis and how to build a viable strategy for the future. So Carla, Carla uh, has uh, a degree in economics and he has wide experience with working uh, with audiobooks and normal books. Well, probably we still remember what is a normal book. It's a thing <laughs> like a paper thing. <laughs> There's a real paper thing that has some weight. <laughs> and uh, also, Carla is a founder of a real interesting project. He is a founder of many projects, but he's a founder of a really interesting project. This is called uh, Reboot Books. It's a kind a mixture of uh, conference, think tank, and community. And that is rethinking books, how to make books and how to sell books. Well, Carla, so uh, what, to your opinion, what has been broken during this COVID crisis uh, in the book market or content market? Or what do you think about um, the market does book it, book market exist oh yes of course it exists but first thank you for the opportunity to be here i'm a big fan of what media international media associates international does and it's a pleasure to be here so yes of course there is a book market and i think that what covid did is to show a little bit what was broken but more importantly and i'm a very optimistic person in related to this is that it made everyone act very fast to to fix this stuff so it was so interesting in the beginning of covid everyone was so pessimistic bookstores were closed i think the the moment where we had the most pessimism when it was italy closed all the bookstores and everything and but on the other hand i i remember commenting to a friend well Everyone is stuck at home. So if you don't get people to buy books and read now, I mean, that's, you know, you don't compete <laughs> with movies anymore. You don't compete with parks, everything. So actually that's what happened. So on one hand, you, you, wanted, you had people reading books. Lots of people read books they had accumulated. So that didn't, mean, that didn't mean it had, it was direct sales. But at the same time, the book industry just accelerated all the trends from eBooks, to audiobooks, but also and especially for e-commerce. So bookstores are never consider e-commerce, starting to have e-commerce, marketplaces uh, you know, uh, flourish. And, and I'd like to use a good example of Sweden. Sweden, because we are kind of the paria of treating COVID in the world, we never mm -hmm. close the bookstores. Doesn't mean that people were too much at the bookstores, but we are probably the most open country. And even here last year, Bookstore sales went down 19% and online sales went up 19%. Uh, so all those trades accelerated. So I think that actually part of what was broken started to be fixed. Also, you had a meeting on social media already, but I just had this on Reboot. We had these two bookstores talking about how they moved events to digitally and how social media, social media became uh, 
something something big and it grew also. So also I think during this time, actually lots of bookstore booksellers got closer to their customers. Uh, there is uh, this bookseller in Romania, uh, Karu Shasti. It's so hard to pronounce the name, mm. but they actually you could go online and actually schedule a time with a bookseller to discuss books and decide what you buy. And before, mm. and the CEO of the company said that before that, no one, everyone said they didn't have time to talk to the, to the, to the, to the customers. So I think lots of things that were a little broken actually got fixed. So I'm very optimistic right now. So the first uh, one of the tendencies, and actually uh, I read uh, in um, a report, uh, Europe, uh, European Book Publishers Association did a report on the COVID influence of the COVID crisis on the European book market. And it says that a number of markets did surprisingly well during the pandemic and spreading, and the winners were the uh, Nordic countries. Winners in which sense? The, the... Uh, that they did best. That they, they did much better than. Um, yeah, because uh, online online is pretty much set up here. Subscription models is a is a is a daily reality, and and libraries uh, really work. Uh, I mean, our libraries here are amazing. So uh, my kids prefer to go to a library than to a bookstore. So I think that was that was part of the reason, maybe. <laughs> mm, okay, so uh, one. Uh, did you feel that uh, during this um, COVID crisis, uh, some new um, some new business uh, some new business models appeared? Uh, again, I no, but I think things accelerated a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, and so, uh, so what, what are the tendencies? So, yeah, um, I think that the tendencies have been the same. I even called the new business model like the old one because we've been talking to them about years, and they are happening, but. It's a very, you know, somehow it's a very slow process. I was another meeting discussing with the, with only Spanish publishers and people another day, and one guy was so frustrated that print on demand would never uh, really scale in, in Latin America. Said, so, but you know, actually, it's moving up. It's getting a lot better. It's just slow. So I think these models got accelerated. But one thing basically is. Uh, E-commerce, e-commerce as a whole, especially marketplaces, and I can talk about each of them. I think the subscription model that was growing anyway uh, got even accelerated because it's very related to digital, and audiobooks uh, just got more attention. I don't know if audiobooks were that influenced by COVID or not, but because it was digital and everything that was digital started to get attention from everyone, I think it became. Uh, you know, just start to have more visibility. So I think uh, those things, and they all related, one thing in common about them, it's digital sales. I mean, when when you go digital, publishers tend to think only about eBooks. I think that's not the most important thing about going digital. Going digital means your sales are digital, even for print books and your marketing, as you have discussed already, mm -hmm. uh, and other are digital. So I think those things accelerate or got more visible and publishers became more open uh, to discuss it and to, you know, and to, and to move and do and invest a little bit of resources and time on that. Hmm. So um, we have uh, some people from, uh, we have the participants from South Africa, from Denmark, from uh, Slovenia, from uh, Oxford, uh, from yeah. no Norway, and it's really interesting. Colin is uh, a independent micro publisher from South Africa, so uh, I don't think uh, here, uh, but uh, we have many big publishers among the participants. Okay. And you mentioned uh, one thing that um, thinking about the future and thinking about the present we should take into consideration the subscription model. So small publishers, how can, and authors, how, how they, uh, can they make use of subscri uh, subscription model? Okay, so first let's define more or less what's the subscription model. Basically it's the Netflix model because most people here either subscribe to Netflix or use a friend's account or family's account like they do in Brazil. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, basically, it's a model where you pay monthly and you can consume uh, either as many books as you want, which is called the All You Can Eat subscription model, very controversial, or mm -hmm. you can get a token and then you can choose one book per month, more or less what is the Audible model. Uh, or you can get some hours of audiobooks. Uh, for instance, Storytel offers that in some markets. But that basically is that the consumer pays per month and they can get the content. So you don't make individual decisions, which would be the, the paper download model. This is growing a lot. And I think thanks to Netflix, because Netflix was really the pioneer in this model. Uh, I'm not saying, I want to emphasize this, I'm not saying that the rest of the world is going to be like Scandinavia, it's never going to be, but I think Scandinavia is ahead on the subscription model, so it's always interesting to look at what's happening here. So now in Stockholm, for instance, you have coffee subscription. You know, so you, you can buy a kind of uh, a ticket uh, for six cups of coffee or ten cups of no. coffee. No, of okay. course it's digital, you know, <laughs> because we don't <laughs> and they get your digital coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but you pay per month, and for just a, a, a regular coffee, I think it's fifteen euros. You pay per month, and you can have as much a coffee as you want in the in the Swedish Starbucks okay. or the espresso house. Mm -hmm. The only thing is, you have one coffee per hour. So once you have one, you have to wait 60 minutes to get the next one. Mm -hmm. Now they expanded it to make it, there's a more expensive ones that you can get a cappuccino anyway. Or you can get a subscription of a uh, car wash here. So you pay per month and you can wash your car as many yeah, times as yeah. well. Okay, so that's, that's how things is, are, are here. Mm -hmm. And then you have Storytel, which is one of the largest audiobook platforms that is present now in 20 markets. And they want to be in another 20 markets by by 2023 mm -hmm. and so they have this model where you know you pay per month and and you can consume everything publishers and particularly some big publishers are very critical they think they don't get paid enough they think that there is cannibalization they think that it can destroy the market in sweden there hasn't been visible cannibalization yet the sales of print books are going down but the digital sales are going up so much that it's making up. That doesn't mean it's going to be like that forever. It's very early to make scientific conclusions yeah. about cannibalization. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so that's a complicated model. Uh, but if but we look at uh, if we look at this model, fr a model from the author or publisher point of view. So what uh, does the author or publisher need to do to join into this subscription model market? He needs well, to it, find, uh, he can yeah. do it himself. He can, needs to find a partner. Uh, depends, uh, it depends on which country you are. So um, uh, if you have Storytel in your country or if you have uh, Audible in your country, but Audible is only in Italy, Germany, Spain and the US. Uh, some of them offer ways that you can upload it yourself or you can use third party, party aggregators that can mm -hmm. help you to do that. So, uh, for instance, if you are a publisher in English or in some, or maybe Spanish, I think they do as well. And they do other languages. You have find a way in the US that you know that you distribute your content to all the platforms. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you have, for instance, I work also for Streetlib, which is a digital aggregator in Italy, and we distribute um, books if, either from others and also from small publishers in every language to all the platforms we can get to. So it's not limited to Italian. You have someone called Publish Drive in Hungary that does that as well. And some of these platforms, if you're a small publisher, you can just make a deal with them and, uh, and start producing. So Storytel, for instance, there is a very interesting model that I think I should talk about it. So if Storytel is not in your market, depend on the size of your market, it might be soon. Um, or if you produce in English, like you have people from South Africa and UK here, mm -hmm. and they're not in English yet, but you have other platforms like Audible, and that's going to be through a contract Amazon. But even Storytel, they you take English content. But what one thing they do in when they arrive in a new market, they are going to <clears throat> Indonesia. That's the next one. They actually make deals with publishers, and they finance the audiobook production. So mm. they pay for the whole production as an advance of future sales. So mm -hmm. the good side of it is that, okay, I'm a publisher, I can now have an audiobook and I don't need to 
spend a lot of money on it because audiobooks are a lot more expensive than ebooks. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, of course, that involves an exclusive deal. And these exclusive deals, honestly, are not exactly that good for the market because they yeah, are so forced. you have to commit for so many years or forever. Yeah, from from two to five years. Okay. Never, as I was saying, digital never sign anything for more than two years. So, but that's for some publishers. Let's let's face it. I don't like it because I think it destroys the market. But at the same time, for some publishers, there is no real real option of producing audio books right now. And to be honest, if a marketing is just starting for the next two or three years, there won't be much sales anyway. So it's a good way to start experiment. I mean, I think you should, uh, people should consider it. Outbound when they go to, but they only go to big markets so far, but they, they also try to offer similar, similar stuff like that. There are, there are some aggregators like Bookwire, which is based in Germany. And they work just like these other aggregators I said, that they also do the same thing, they finance they finance your production for some specific titles as long as they are the only one distributing to all the platforms and they then you pay back with the sales you're going to do. So there are some creative ways happening because audiobooks mm -hmm. and a global average with a huge standard deviation will cost 100 euros per hour just for production to have a final audiobook. Mm -hmm. And then every sixth or seventh pages is an hour, so you do the math. And so it's not exactly a cheap process. So uh, the best way I think is to find uh, for a small publisher is to find an aggregator, which one that, uh, and that for that you're gonna be in an Apple, a Kobo and every, everywhere. Because if you yourself start to try to, to take care of that, it's a lot of work for very, very little money at the moment. So I think that would be the best way. And for audio, the real challenge is, is the resources. So there are so, these other possibilities. But if you are in a market Let's say there are two Slovenians on the audience. So that means the Slovenians are the best represented country in our audience right now. And it's a country I really like. I've just been to Ljubljana two weeks ago. Mm. Um, so if you are, if you are in, in Slovenia where you don't have a local platform yet, it's very complicated to start recording Slovenian audiobooks because you have no revenues uh, for some time until someone makes a platform or someone gets yeah. there. So it's, uh, I think it's something that people should be watching, seeing what's going on in the market, be prepared, learning, but the exact moment we start investing might be, may, may not be now depending on the market where you are. Mm. But uh, you should advise, uh, and, uh, and a question to our African friends. So okay. uh, are there any book aggregators, uh, any aggregators like this uh, in Africa who are using and subscription models, or uh, most of them speak English, so they can uh, join. Yes, in the yeah. well, English is almost a king. Exactly. I'm not. I'm not here to advertise one of the companies I work for, but yeah. Streetly actually has a in its history. It's in Italy, but they also always had a very interesting look to Africa, and they always believed that you know Africa has a huge potential. So if you go to the website and you see. The, or a publisher account, you see all these African flags oh. <laughs> right there. So yes, I think Street Lib is the most open one to Africa right now. And and they really, I say they because, you know, I, I'm, I'm part time there. It's my company, but uh, they're really open to, when I mentioned to the CEO something about African publishers, he said, that's what you are here for. That's our kind of guys. So yeah, if, if, you, if you're looking for an aggregator in Africa, take a look at Street Lib or just drop me an email and I, I will help you because we really, that's exactly the kind of guys we're looking for. I'm not so sure about if my, the other like Publish Drive, Bookwire, they're really interested in African content right now. But if you publish in English or French or Spanish from Africa, well, there's only one culture speaks Spanish in Africa, but or from Latin America, Yes, try to get a global aggregator that you bring your books to all over the world. Yeah, to Spain if you're from Bolivia, to UK and the US if you are from I don't know, from Botswana and so forth. Well, Angus is saying that in academic publishing, most aggregators uh, run out of the global north, apart from uh, African Books Collective. Well, exactly, but so. Again, I don't want to advertise, talk to you strictly. Do we really want to? <laughs> uh, yeah, 
So uh, we've been uh, up to now. We've been talking about audiobooks, but um, still uh, we still have uh, e-books and we have paper books. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, print on demand um, is kind of growing, at least in Europe. Yes, it's yeah because print on demand depends on having uh, a local printer that has the technology to print one book. So when I say print on demand, and I'll insist on this, I mean that the print run is one. So yeah. if we're printing two copies, it's low print runs. It's not print on demand in my opinion, okay? It's so got, got to, books, to do one. Okay. Yeah, okay. because <laughs> Brazil, for instance, Brazil, for instance, where I market it well, took years to actually have print on demand as we have today. And during these years, it was very fun that you find a print course. No, you do one book. Okay, you do one, perfect. So uh, what's, the, what's the price for one copy? Oh no, but you need to order 10 minimum. So, okay, so you do one, but I need to order 10. So it was not really one to one. Yeah, the yeah. challenge of this technology is not the machines because the machines are the same ones you use for, print, for digital printing of 100, 200. It's the workflow. It's the software that connects everything and then tells the machine what to print because yeah. you need to print one different book after the other without stopping the machine. Mm -hmm. on, on web on raw on web fed machines it, it's yeah. the first time i saw this with my eyes a few years ago so, wow i could see all these different books coming out of the mm -hmm. machine yeah. yeah i saw so, one in moscow uh -huh. yeah moscow has it so it's not it's, it. it's europe but the us is pretty advanced and australia has it but then let's go back to the guys that print that produce books in english and again sorry slovenians your language is only spoken there so it's more complicated but uh, if you publish in English or French, you can, you can go to send your files to a print on demand platform, and then your books will be available in Australia or in France or in the US. So basically, it was Ingram, the largest distributor in the world, that created print on demand, created this, this model. And now, in the last two years, Ingram, always, who always focused on distributing English content to the world, and by English, I mean UK and American. They started really to ask their partners to get local content so they can distribute local content to the other countries, including in foreign languages. So for English particularly, it's a great opportunity. They are really open to that. The digital aggregators that I mentioned, all of them, they distribute in audio, in eBooks and print on demand because from a technological distribution point of view, a POD file, the PDF you send to the printer, or an audio file, or an ebook is works the same. You know, it, yeah. it's just file control being downloaded. So again, if you find one of these aggregators, you can start putting your books there, and they should be able to redistribute that to Ingram and to to other platforms. So, uh, Publish Driving Hungary just announced this week that they made a deal with Ingram, for instance, or they can distribute to other things. It's not as well developed and as well connected as as ebooks and audiobooks yet, but that's coming and that's interesting. Honestly, to have print on demand in Africa locally, I think the only country I know that has something and is a part of Ingram South Africa. Uh, yeah, Colin is saying, Colin from South Africa is saying that the problem with print on demand here in South Africa is that uh, then getting the book delivered. Yes, that that's is the where the costs uh, come in. Yeah, that's true as well uh, because of of, um, of the post office and stuff like that. But uh, at the same time, you don't you kind of necessarily don't have the the bookseller involved, so you can create a platform that you have a better margin for you. But yeah, post office is always a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, and Angus is mention mentioning that POD in Africa. Uh, okay, Ghana only two too. countries have uh, POD, uh, South Africa and Ghana. Yeah, mm. so of course you need, if you have a good post office, but okay, let me give you an optimistic example. Okay. So before the COVID, Argentina only sold this online sales of books in Argentina was only, it was less than 1%, it was nothing. So our, Buenos Aires had this, still has this most beautiful bookstores, great, but then online was impossible. The post office in Argentina, was just terrible and because if they go to your house you're not there they don't have to pick up yourself then there is a line then they yeah. don't find whatever a, a nightmare mm -hmm. and then i would always look at buenos aires and go this city is flat 
you know, you have uh, 10 million people in the great Buenos Aires, and I think almost 3 million on the Rio downtown, it's absolutely flat. Why mm -hmm. can't someone just start delivering by, with bikes, you know? But no one did anything, no one did anything. Then COVID came, the bookstores closed. Mm -hmm. Well, now the marketers is using marketplaces. Marketplaces is when you actually sell your book through Amazon or through other partner, but you take care of all the, the logistics. Of delivery and everything, yeah. Bookstores are delivering with bikes, everything's happening. So yes, it's hard, it's a challenge, but we need to start uh, exploiting possibilities. Italy, just for you to feel good, Italy is the same problem. So working with Street Lib, I've been aware of the POD market in Italy. A POD book in Italy might take 28 days to arrive, not because of the, so much of the printing time, because of all the logistics and people insist yeah. in sending the book from the printer to the distributor, to the bookseller, to the final customer. So there are lots of problems, yes, but I think we should try to, to solve them. And come on, I'm Latin American, I know Africans can be as creative as us, so. Well, they can be. form a bikers club that can deliver books all over Africa yeah. on the bike. Yes. So, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a problem, but but uh, I think it's coming and I think it's been, it's a, a, a very good possibility. So uh, what do you think, what's happening to eBooks? Well, eBooks grew a lot, I think during the, during the, the pandemics. Did uh, you feel that all types of eBooks uh, grew a lot, uh, fiction and nonfiction alike, or uh, this, I, uh, there is any discrepancy here? I don't, I don't know, and I, I haven't seen, okay. I haven't looked too much into general comparison. As a product grew naturally because people wanted a book and they didn't have bookstores, or people want to launch, publishers wanted to launch a title, <laughs> and there was no way to launch a physical book, so they launched it digital first. So, honestly, in the in the main in the main trade market. Ebooks are just part of life. I don't, I don't see people discussing anymore if you should do it or should not do it, or if it's, it works or if it's not. You know, it's there. It's what, 15, 20% maybe in some markets. In some other markets, it's 10. But it's part of it. And, and if you establish the ebook production in your regular print book production, you know, basically the extra costs are minimal. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's really easy. So then, oh, I don't have time to deal with all these stores. Find an aggregator and you just upload the books. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a very simple reality now. And then again, for these publishers who to publish in English in Africa or in Spanish in Latin America, come on, it's a way to make your book available to a much higher audience to give access to more people and by the way as a christian publisher to spread the word so uh, if there is actually christian publishers should be the first ones to experiment with all kinds of uh different models that brings more access to people by definition so yeah because we have aggregators we have the roman roads exactly so and um uh, you said once um a thing that sounds a bit uh scary to me you said that content is not the king any longer that access is the king yeah so can you uh well expand it's on it very good if you create very good content but the book stays in the shelf and no one opens it who cares right so and you know for someone to go there you need people need the readers need access to the books so also we live in a world, try to get my kids and go to the library and bookstore and say, oh, I want this book. Oh, no, it's not here. What? They're using it to Netflix where they have all the movies there. Oh, it's not on Netflix. They'll find it on your book, on YouTube. So mm -hmm. today you're living in a, in a society that content is easily accessed online and digitally by anyone. So providing content with very limited access, uh, I, don't, I think it's very complicated because of the new generations uh and because if you want your content to really change the world and again it is even stronger and more important to christian publishing uh we need to give it access so when ebooks showed up ebooks generate access three kinds of access it generates economic access because ebooks of course they are cheaper than print books of course also in the beginning they were not of course there were some 
crazy disparities in the beginning, but if you go today, ebooks are cheaper than print books. So that creates economic access. So it's um, about like 15, normally it's 15, 20% cheaper. Yeah. Okay. So it's already something. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if and the more audacious publishers who make promotions and sell it for one euro or yeah. whatever, you can never sell a print book for one euro because it costs more to produce it. So, sure. so, mm -hmm. so, you know, you can play around. Then the second access is geograph geographical. As again, African publishers in English, you can now have your books available and give access to people in the US, UK, Australia, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and also when you think of in a country like Brazil, where you basically, the libraries, unfortunately, are terrible with a couple of exceptions. Uh, we only have 1,000 real bookstores in the whole Brazil. I'm not mm -hmm. talking Christian bookstores, I'm talking Normal. You know, normal. Actually, Christian bookstores are not in there, so probably going to have another 300 maybe. Uh, and then you have these people living in the Amazon, and of course they have absolutely no access to a book, to a physical book. Again, distribution, just like in South Africa, becomes a problem. It's very expensive to buy, even to buy a book from there online and stuff like that. But then digital brings geographical access because you can easily access uh, access. Uh, digital content. Uh, if you go to Africa, what Word Reader is doing, this organization that provides uh, uh, ebooks to, to communities there, also it's interesting. And the third access thing that I think as Christians you should really pay a lot of the attention to is to handcuff people and not just blind people. So if you get a, a EPUB file, a very good, a well done EPUB file, Mm -hmm. It can easily be read out aloud for an artificial voice. Yeah. It's not mm -hmm. like an audiobook yet, but for a blind person, it works. Uh, it can be used with other bra um, Braille machines that actually read an EPUB file. They're just fantastic machines. They read the EPUB file, and then the blind person can read here and then go mm -hmm. to the other line. The whole thing changes reading the EPUB file. And another thing that people forget is. EPUB files can easily be read by dys dyslexic people because you have software and apps that actually make the test in different colors and stuff. And that makes it reading a lot easier for dyslexic people. So I'm not just mm -hmm. talking about blind, the mm -hmm. blind people. I'm talking about dyslexic people, people that are handicapped physically, so to, that cannot hold a book. And there you go. So it's a lot of people. Uh, so in that sense, access is king, because I think content is the queen maybe, but you need to take it around. Or if you do content and no one looks at it, it you're not really gonna change the world. Right. But, so that's um, my... Don't you think that um, this is also a danger because uh, there can be uh, the people who will be well, uh, Colin is saying that discoverability is also key. Yeah, of yeah, course. It's true. But uh, there is also a danger uh, because uh, if uh, people know how, uh, some organization or some author knows how to market his book and how to sell his book digitally, uh, uh, the, uh, this can uh, end up as uh, that it can up uh, that uh, like mediocre content will be prevailing in the market if uh, people who have great content won't learn to sell it yeah as well yeah exactly so you're proving my point so people who have very good content <laughs> because this is going to happen <laughs> you know so if you have mediocre content without commercial value to it why not just spread it one way on the every, every every way you can just to to get your face there just like what happens with all half the youtubers are just pathetic content yeah. yes but that's going to happen so if you that you believe you have important content that's actually, you know, gonna change the world, and that's important to get it there. If you, you don't give this content access, this danger we're talking, yes. But the, the real danger is that you don't give access to the good content while the other guys are giving access to bad content, mm -hmm. because they will. So another reason you to to really find ways to have your content in access, because any and any, any other way to control this flirts pretty close to censorship somehow in some way so it's i think it's a free word and people always be able to have stupid ideas promoted look at my my counters my brazil's president no uh mm -hmm. and uh so i think that's gonna happen anyway so that's another reason for 
us that we we believe we have very good content and are I, I think we have the responsibility to give access with this culpability everywhere also. Mm -hmm. So, but that's accepting is just a provocation. So, you know, in six months when people here won't remember anything, I said they ought to at least remember <laughs> access is king. And that's just a, a provocation to re out, keep in mind that we really need to just obey the Bible and take the word to the all yeah. po points of the earth. So I have two questions. I have one question for the participants and one question to you. The question for the participants. Uh, one of the uh, topics of okay. our talk today is fixing what's broken so that uh, we could be more practical and what uh, we'll be talking about. So uh, if you want, if you feel like it, you can mention some of the things that uh, were broken in uh, your publishing house for example or in your ministry and that needs to be fixed and we can think about how it can be helped maybe we can give some ideas and uh, a question meanwhile a question to Carla Carla and do you think uh, that there are some new dangers on the market now um, depends on what uh... I think bookstores are really in danger right now. And generally speaking, more the, the, the general bookstores maybe than Christian bookstores because they are really attached to the community and to the church. So actually they might be better protected. But for the general market, I mean, we survived a pandemic without bookstores and sales yeah. are up with the exception of Russia, which I still don't know what exactly happened. There. But uh, so, there is this question in every publisher's minds or analysis, and no one, everyone is afraid to say it, but it's, do we really need the bookstores? You know, from an economic point of view. Uh, so uh, the pandemic showed that the market can survive at least in the short term without the bookstores. So I think there is a danger, uh, there's a huge danger for the bookstores. And then this is a danger because in markets where you don't have libraries, bookstores are the main point of discoverability and the, the main point to learn about books and to get acquainted with books. So if you imagine a country with no libraries and no bookstores, how people will actually like books. Is school, people tend to hate books at schools because they're forced to read. So yeah. that really worries me. When I look at Scandinavia, I don't mind because they're libraries and the libraries can really replace the bookstores for that particular thing. But mm -hmm. when I think about Brazil, I think it's very complicated if bookstores really start to disappear. During pandemics, some in independent bookstores grew. You had things showing up like bookshop.org, which is a platform that allows independent publish bookstores to sell books just like Amazon in the US and the UK. Uh, but still, I think uh, bookstores are really in danger because it's very hard to find economic balance and the bookstores with the competition from, from online sales. So I think that's a danger. The other danger is, I'm gonna use Netflix analogy again, is if publishers, and I'm not just talking Christian publishers, I'm talking Christians yeah. and Christians. Mm -hmm. If publishers don't jump into new formats and new forms of access, or at least they don't allow, or, or even if you worse, if, even worse, if they, don't allow it, if they try to say, no, my content is not for that, we might have the same situation we have at Netflix. So if you look at Netflix history, they were a rental company. So you could rent the real movies and uh, the DVDs on Netflix. Then because the internet got better and then you, there was the subscription idea, you, you put subscription plus streaming together and you create the Netflix model. Then Netflix needed content. Then the California studio said, no way, you know, who are you? I need my content on TV. I need my content on the movie theaters. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then what happened to Netflix? They said, okay, I had to produce my own content there. And then they started producing their own content. And now they start winning Oscars and winning festivals. Mm -hmm. And then Amazon started producing as well. And to be honest, the original content owners actually lost uh, influence and power in that process. So I think publishers have a lesson to learn here that we need to engage in these new models, these new forms of access with these new companies, you know, in order to retain our position of producing book or reading content, you know, because if you don't, 
this, there is a danger that these platforms will just grow and start producing themselves. As by so the way, there is the kind of danger us, of yeah. So, so there is a kind of danger of usurpation of the market by a big aggregator. Yeah, by by well, new the new new players on the on the block that they need content for their original uh, project or the original idea. We say no, we don't give you content. So okay, so I have to do it myself to survive. And in this process, we might create we might transform uh, a sales outlet into a competitor. You know, so I think we should be we should be careful because some of them always will have the tendency to be a competitor anyway. So, but you also we shouldn't help them to go so fast into that direction, maybe. So I think there is a danger that publishers might be out. I mean, being very extreme in the worst case scenario, publishers will just be kicked out from the from the arena because these new players will just start producing their own content. So uh, that's something to think about. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, and Todd is uh, asking a question. Todd from uh, Slovenia. How to change from being a small mission publishing house where we have to raise funds for every book to being something that is more self-supporting? Is it easier right now in, in with Slovenia? Oh, than... That's hard, <laughs> particularly hard. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Anna. So uh, um, I just wanted to expand the question and ask, is it uh, easier with the modern digital, digital, digital everything to become self-supporting or it's harder? Uh, no, I think, well, it's as an investment in the short term, it's going to be harder. So maybe what someone could do is instead of uh, uh, raising funds for specific books, you can raise funds for a digital project or you can raise funds to create, let's say, uh, I'll give you a very crazy hands-on idea. You can contact Pilgrim in Brazil. Pilgrim is, a, is an audiobook platform, an app that you have on your phone only for Christian books. And then mm. you can use their platform as a white label in Slovenia. I don't know if they're interested. They don't even know who they are. But, and, then you, and then for that, maybe you can raise funds. It might be easier to raise funds for a whole project and the whole platform and that in the future will bring more revenues to your to what you're doing so in the beginning of course you're going to spend more than you're going to get but in the future the more you spread out their books are more revenues you get from that again and i know i again i, I have lots of slovenian friends yeah <laughs> but you only have two million people i know that's the, the real challenge in, in slovenia so it's harder to for you but for the other language i think people are sometimes are wasting time. You know, if you have the privilege of having English as your first language, why are you selling the largest markets in the world? Or are you giving this, this content there? Uh, but I think one first, first step is to stop looking book by book and maybe start looking more as a project or as how can I create an outlet for digital books here? For instance, uh, in Slovenia, thanks to Biblius, uh there is a very good demand for digital books at the slovenian public system in the bookstore i don't know if god's books are there or not but that means that people are reading digitally if they can get the book at the library so maybe why not think about a platform a library platform even for free for christian books and then get resources for that than specifically books maybe you spend the same amount of time to get more money and have something more more uh impactful but again, it's very easy for a Brazilian sitting here in Stockholm to say that. So I don't have the magic solution. I know it's hard, but uh, hey, guys, I'm available. Drop me a line if you just want to discuss crazy ideas and brainstorm. So that's what I just did here with one specific case. Yeah, and uh, we're still thinking. Uh, we had uh, once, uh, so I know Todd personally, and we had a meeting with uh, Slovenian publishers a few years ago talking about the market. But I think in these years, a few years, uh, on digitalization, many things changed. And I think uh, right now there is more hope for Slovenia with, uh, than yeah. uh, before. Because and right now you don't need, at least you don't need a printed book. And no, and there is a report in Slovenia that 6% of the people were listening to audiobooks in Slovenia. Yeah. Uh, and there's no there's no Slovenia audiobook, so that's all foreign. So imagine if uh, you start producing some stuff there. Uh, can I say something about audiobooks just before I forget? Yeah. Audiobooks, 
you should not think so much about audio books, but more about audio content. So Christian culture and tradition is very audio, mm -hmm. starting from Jesus Christ who give the sermons and stuff like that. Uh, so actually, I think the church and Christianity has lots of audio content already from sermons, from our pastors, from lots of things we keep recording. And sometimes you can just edit sermons. By edit, I don't mean line by line. You can just get a sermon, mm -hmm. of an opening audio, a closing audio, make that into a podcast or an audio book, put that in the platforms because it's subscription based. You don't need to sell the whole thing. It's just if someone listens a little bit, he likes the sermon, he's gonna listen the whole thing and you start monetizing that a little bit. So uh, particularly in, in for Christian publishers, think out of the box, not about the content you have in print, but about audio content that you can produce or that's already recorded without having the book. And that's still content, that's still important, that's still audio, and that can bring revenues to actually do the, the audio books that are expensive. Just a comment that I want to make sure I didn't forget. Yeah, yeah, it's so. uh, kind of a great idea to monetize what you already have and that you don't need to produce, actually. And uh, there is a comment from uh, uh, Denmark. A lot depends on legal and financial issues that are not entirely resolved between the writer and publisher. For example, contracts, including uh, vid uh, word libraries. Semi self publishing may be the future in um, Denmark, also to ensure minimum quality. As a reader, I avoid Danish books, use Amazon, Kindle in English, French, and German. Danish books, even as ebooks, are expensive, and publishers need to rethink, and uh, bookstores are closing. Okay, uh -huh. so it's interesting uh, this because. Denmark is the craziest, I, I'm talking audio, but audio in Scandinavia, digital is basically audio and ebooks are all, in all these platforms that I mentioned for audio, they also offer ebooks. And, and Denmark is the, the crowdest market <laughs> right now in, in apps and stores selling and offering subscription of audio books and ebooks. Mm -hmm. Including Bookmates, the Russian platform is the number two in Denmark. You know, mm -hmm. and then storytell is there and they have all those things. Uh, I think one of the reasons that <clears throat> digital content is too expensive is that maybe publishers are so focused now in Scandinavia on the subscription platforms that they don't care so much about the paper, don't take their download system. So I work for Word Audio, which is a publisher that was, now it's Danish. It was recently acquired by Gildendal, the largest Danish. And it, it used to be Swedish. Just, yeah, it's still in Sweden, but it now belongs to Gidenau. Yeah. So we have to cross the bridge and because it's in Malmö. Anyway, yeah. when I was working there, I started myself to upload content through an aggregator to Apple and all these paper download platforms. I decided the price and no one cared. I mean, no one cared about the, 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 the cover price. It doesn't matter because 95% of the revenues were from subscription. So, okay, if you're going to sell one or two on paper download, charge you nine euros, charge you 14, charge you 19. I mean, no one really cares. So because of that, I think maybe Danish, I'm, I guarantee that Swedish publishers do that. They just put uh, okay, an okay price there, whatever. And they don't pay much attention. So, but maybe you should try the, the one of the Danish platforms uh, to see how the Dan if the Danish content is there. Uh, for even for ebooks and stuff like that. I would love to to know your impressions on that because I've been looking at the Danish market, but I don't know so much uh, on the you no know, hands-on level. But I, I, I guarantee you that when subscription becomes the main thing, uh, the market stops caring about the the price of the audiobooks and only discuss the price of the, the subscriptions. Hmm. You also managed that uh, mentioned that um, uh, with no, that right now we have a possibility to target consumer directly, that the publishers have this possibility, new possibility to target consumers directly. So um, how? Uh, well, I think social media and the discussion we had two days ago, that I think yeah, it's yeah. Uh, one of the answers. But more than that is to remember that because five years ago, I would go to well, the largest Brazilian publisher and ask, who is your main client? And he would say the name of the bookstore. Mm. So, so publishers traditionally, and until very, very recently, never cared 
about the reader, about the final consumer. They, they, they think about the, the distribution chain. Oh, my, my customer is the bookstore. And, and, you know, I have a friend in Brazil that would go to, a, to an event that we had like and consumers there, not a professional event for the general public. They go, oh, no, 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 the readers are coming. Oh, my God, no, no, let me get out of here. So we're just joking, but that's been pretty much um, the attitude, especially at least in the trade publishing about that. And, and recently, people realized that first, they need to understand the consumer better. So all this data that Amazon has and we don't have, well, it's a little bit of our fault because until Amazon showed up, we never cared about having this data. We never cared about mm -hmm. who the to the consumer was. So I say that more in a philosophical way and to remember that, but social media is great, not just to promote your books, but to get feedback, right? And companies like Kobo, because I'm, everyone complains that Amazon doesn't give you any data, true. But then Kobo gives you all the data you want, basically. Yeah. At Kobo, you can actually know when readers stop reading your book. So you can get, okay, 30% of the readers stop reading my book here. So there is, maybe there's a problem in this paragraph, whatever. And I should rewrite it or do something. Yeah. Ask Kobo how many publishers ask this data to them. Almost no one. Mm -hmm. so, so people complain about Amazon, but then they don't use the data they have available. Yeah. So, uh, so just, uh, I think it's more, uh, as I said, uh, a strategic and philosophical way you need to think about the, 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 the final reader, try to, and, and social media is a great way to contact with them. Try to do a newsletter maybe, or maybe it's worth for you to create your own bookstore. And today you don't need to create your own bookstore, making all the programming and everything. You know, you can look at the model of bookshop.org or maybe there is a marketplace. Maybe there is a, a very simple way to offer your own books. It, it's not that expensive. And maybe we'll sell a very little compared to the bookstore, but you start learning who is this person who buys your books. You start learning which page is more visited. You start getting data from, from your consumer. So it's, it's mm -hmm. more into that direction, not to forget that the, our consumer is the reader and not uh, Miladinska bookstore in Slovenia. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and imagine that, um... You, Carla Karenia, uh, wrote a book. Okay. So you wrote a book. You have, I have it written. You have the script. You have the text. What would uh, what uh, would you do with this text? How would you promote this book? And uh, where would you? What would you do with your book? Well, the main decision is: Are going to try to? to publish through the traditional channels, through the publishers that are here in the audience too, or you're going to do that yourself. So today it's, there is no barrier anymore to, especially digitally, but even with POD, even in print, to publish the book yourself. You can find some professionals to help you if you need that. And then you're gonna have it in, at least on Amazon in a pretty easy way. Um, but then it comes the real challenge, I think. That's exactly what you said, how you're gonna promote your book. So if you go to a publisher, let's be honest, with very rare exceptions, publishers don't promote the books well enough and the elders are always uh, frustrated because they don't get the same kind of promotion. But the problem the publisher has is a little bit of the same problem that the elder has the law and the law is more complicated. So basically you need to find traction to your book. You need to, as an elder, even if you go to a publisher, you need to have a base of readers. So today it's not enough anymore to create the fantastic uh, uh, book because mm -hmm. there's so much content available. People are spending time on games, on the telephone, on WhatsApp group, on Netflix, on Storytel, all that, on podcasts, that just publishing a very good book doesn't mean he's gonna get an attention. So we need to get more attention. And things are changing too. Attention before was to get a very nice review on the newspaper. Honestly, today, that doesn't help much. So usually today, it demands from the elder himself to, to create his own base, to be in touch with his own readers, to put his voice out there in other, other platforms. So if you're an elder and have good ideas, why not create also a, a podcast or something like that that people listen more? It is very hard. I don't have the formula. If I had the formula, I would be a millionaire right now. Uh, 
and I think it depends case by case, but you need to have to create to have either to have or to create a base. Unfortunately, that's very cruel because then people that have a base but they have no content at all, like uh, some YouTubers that my kids love watching, can easily promote anything, including books, to and sell it. And then people who might have the very good ideas but that don't have uh, uh, a platform uh, or don't have a base of readers and he's not gonna know, might just never get anywhere. So, you know, it's been, it's hard. I don't have, I don't have the formula, but I know that you need to create this, your own, your own base and just write the book. Oh, it's done, put it there and not do anything else. Forget it. Maybe you need to spend 70% of your time promoting and looking for ideas and 30% writing. If you go to a, to a, if you get the lucky, the luxury of having a contract with a, books, of a book publisher, you can just keep writing mo most of it, but then, you know, you depend on them to promote your book and it probably won't be as good as you are expecting as an author. So it's, uh, it's complicated. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have the magic answer, just <laughs> analyze it. But uh, what I heard uh, is that actually to be a successful author, first you need to have an audience and then write your book. That's a way to put it, more radical than what I said, but uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, or you can write the book first, but then you need the audience. So, yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, and by the way, I, I, I've, I've been saying that for years. I think publishers mission is to find the right books for their audience and not their audience for their books. So that's pretty much more an outdoor yeah. uh, mission. If you really want to write that book, okay. So you need to find an audience for it or the right, you're just wasting your time. You know, and publishers are more, okay, this book needs to have an audience. So, or it doesn't make any sense for me to publish and then try to build up an audience, you know? So uh, at, on one hand, it becomes easier with, with social media and the digital world and no frontiers, et cetera. On the other hand, everyone got on the same road. So it's, it's crowded, right? So how to make your voice, your voice heard, uh, uh, it's complicated. But again, I'm all for trying today try different uh, platforms and stuff like that. if you publish a book do an audio try to do a podcast also try to play a YouTube channel maybe then record some maybe you, you if you if you catch up you know uh, so but it's and of course try to get some good reviews and promote it with your friends and try the old traditional way mm -hmm. but it's it's not easy but I think I think it has always been like that. It's just more crowded now. It's just more, it feels harder because you have so much noise, but before you didn't have so much noise, but you have all these barriers, the publishing control, you could not do it yourself. So today, actually, I think it's more democratic and it's actually better, but it's a lot more, the competition is close by, so. Well, crucifixion of Jesus was a democratic thing also. <laughs> yeah. It was voted for. Well, and uh, in the end, the last uh, word, uh, can you say one word of hope? So what new hope uh, the publishers and authors have in this new digital world that we're well, in? I, I think it's related to a little bit of what I just said. I mean, uh, I think the hope is because digital gives you the chance to really put your content and your your you know your word your uh, your truth uh, without limits you know so if you go if you just had print and you had to print a thousand books there is a physical limitation to it if you go digital you know you can have as many books as you as you could you can read so I think digital made things are gonna again gonna use this word more accessible and more democratic. And so I think that's a great hope, especially for Christian publishing, because if you use all the platforms you have, if you go after that, uh, you can reach a lot more people, you know? So I think that's that's the hope. Uh, again, I imagine a, uh, a publisher in, publishers in English from a small country, let's get out of Africa, let's talk, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, English Guiana in South America, and then now he actually can try to go to the award. Is it done? Is it that easy? No, it's not that easy. It's not done yet. Latin America, 
is still to send a book from Montevideo to, to Buenos Aires, we still have mm. send the books to Miami and even digital is complicated you know, between countries like America, but it's a process. And I think we're getting there and digital, I think just brings more access to everyone and more possibilities. And you can be discussing a lot more crazy ideas, how to bring the message to, the, to our readers than when you are limited by your little town or country or little language. So, and of course, so I think that's it. And so digital it, means more opportunities. Means more opportunities to take, to, to words, use the Christian jargon, to take the mission, the Christian message, yeah. message to, to everyone around the world. Yes, digital, I mean, come on. Why, why did God take so long to put digital in the world so he could spread the word in, in an easier way? No. Okay, <laughs> think about Russia. Okay, I, I always think about that. My father was a director of Open Doors Ministry in Brazil mm -hmm. for a year. So I was really involved in, in the whole uh, Bible comp contraband and taking Bibles to the, to the former communist countries and stuff. Mm -hmm. Today, I mean, that whole thing doesn't make any sense because it doesn't, doesn't matter which control uh, yeah. governments in, in China and Russia can put, I mean, you will have access to content. So there we go. So it, it created new roads to access people. And I think that's, that's the big mm -hmm. hope that you have there, you know, yeah. and, uh, and hopefully some people you learn is Slovenian in the other countries. So the Slovenians can also. Oh, I'm sure that there is a solution for, for Slovenia as well. <laughs> there is one. I just, I just love three, Slovenia. So I, 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 I <laughs> It's a great I really country. Do. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, Carla, thank you. And I hope we'll be talking more and we'll be preparing next month. We'll be preparing uh, two really interesting and unusual panels. Well, great. So, uh, I'm, put, I'm putting my email here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, wait. I tried a couple of times and I stopped. But so uh, also, uh, we, you can contact, uh, I think uh, we have your mail or contacts uh, on the um, MI Europe website, and uh, then the YouTube video will be available uh, sure. tomorrow or uh, uh, Wednesday. Feel free, feel free to contact me if you can just discuss something, have a virtual, virtual coffee. Uh, and then, then, if you really want to, uh, to talk about, um, aggregation with the company I'm helping with, or I can send you the, at least the names and the contacts of the other ones as well. It would be great. Okay, yeah. so I'm, I'm available to you guys. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And thank you everybody. So um, we'll uh, post you about the future events and about a big event, future big event, the international conference that uh, God willing will happen in, uh, Budapest in April. So we'll keep you posted. All right, goodbye and thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Carla. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody.